We're talking about community. And today we're going to talk about the specific aspect of community called reaching out. Another word for that would be connecting. You maybe have heard that word. It's the first word in our missional strategy. We need to connect. We need to connect with God and we need to connect with others. Now we talked about connecting with God last week and the week before. Today we want to talk about connecting with others because community doesn't just happen. Community is built. Community is intentional. Community results when we have first connected with God and then connect with others because of our connection with God. And true community, true fellowship, is always centered in, powered by, and focused on our relationship, our union with God. That's why when we talk about having fellowship, if God never enters a conversation, if he never enters our minds, it's not fellowship. It's socializing. See, Jesus... When we look at the scriptures, especially the Gospels, we see that Jesus was always connecting with people. Always. He was constantly connecting with people. That's what his life was about. And that's because he was intimately connected with the Father. We know that. I mean, he said himself, I can do nothing other than what the Father shows me. I only say what the Father tells me to say. I only go where the Father tells me to go. I only do what the Father tells me to do. That's because of his connection with God. And we're to be the same way. Every disciple, in other words, apprentice, and we use the word apprentice because apprentices don't only hear and learn what the teacher teaches. Apprentices do what the master does. That's why we are calling ourselves apprentices, because we do what the master shows us. Jesus said that every one of my disciples, every one of us, is sent to do the same thing that he did. That's why it says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. That is our mission statement. That's the mission statement of the church the universal church, anywhere there are Christians in this world, that is our mission statement, and that's what we do. Now the question is, how are we particularly gifted and equipped to accomplish that? And what we've said is that how we see ourselves doing that specifically is by connecting, serving, and growing together in Jesus Christ. That's what we do. So our missional strategy, when we talk about what we are doing to fulfill that mission that Jesus gave us, what we do is, number one, connect. We connect with God through all the things we've talked about, and we connect with one another. And by connecting with God, we are enabled to connect with others in ways that maybe we had never anticipated, we never considered. You see, because the plain reality is this, the closer we come to God, the closer we come to one another. That's how real community works. That's how the church works. That's how marriage is intended to work. That's how families work. It's God-centered. And if you see on the triangle, you've all seen this before, there, there are three people or three groups in that. There's God at the top, and then there are two others. Now, from that diagram, there's only one way that you're ever going to get closer to one another, and that is by getting closer to God. If we wonder why sometimes people feel distant in a crowd, perhaps it's that they aren't closer to God. If you wonder why marriages struggle and they feel like there's so much distance between husband and wife, perhaps it's because there's distance, too much distance, between God and husband or God and wife. Works the same way with families, and it certainly works that way with the church. Look, the number one thing we need to do, if we want to feel closer together, if we want more intimate communion, it isn't that we need to do more stuff together, although there's nothing wrong with that. The number one thing we need to do is focus on pursuing God with all that we are, with all that we have, with everything he's given us. Draw near to God, and he draws near to you. And when we are doing that, we sense a bond that we don't sense when we aren't. That's how it works. That's why communion with God is the first priority. Then we can have communion with others. The other reality is, folks, that because we have been given a mission, we are a missionary congregation. 
We are missionaries. We don't send money to missionaries. We're the missionaries. Everywhere we go, we are missionaries. Each of us together and all of us, each of us uh, individually and all of us together. We are the missionaries. When we walk out that door, we are missionaries. We're missionaries in our homes. We're missionaries in our workplaces, in our schools, in our community. We are the missionaries. And Jesus is our example in that. It's his community that we're building after all, right? It's not our community. It's his community. He's the head of the community. He's the center of the community. He's the focal point. And it's his community. So we build his way, not our way. So he shows us then what it really looks like if we're willing to learn. And the other reality is community building always, always, always starts at home. Acts 1.8. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Where were the people who were talking about? They were in Jerusalem. It starts in Jerusalem, and then it goes to the next, which is all of Judea, and then it goes to the next, which is Samaria, and then it goes to the bigger circle, which is the ends of the earth. We are witnesses in Okaboji and Spirit Lake and Milford and the other communities. We're witnesses here. And then we extend to Northwest Iowa, Southwest Minnesota. Then we extend to our nation. Then we extend to the world. We are witnesses because that's what we've been called to do. That's the mission we have been sent on. We're his witnesses, his community. It doesn't, it isn't ours. This church doesn't belong to us. It's his church. We're about his business. And when we do his business, we do it his way and on his timing. Amen? So, what does that community look like? What does it feel like? I can think of no better way to show that than Jesus' example in his interchange, in his community building efforts with Zacchaeus. So let's read Luke 19, 1 through 10. Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. There was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector in the region, and he had become very rich. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed the sycamore fig tree beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass that way. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called his name, Zacchaeus, he said, Quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house with great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased. He's gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor, Lord, and if I've cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. Jesus responded, Salvation has come to this home today, for this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. So what does Christ-formed community look like? Well, we can draw some truths out of that passage because, now remember, what Jesus is doing is reaching out. He's reaching out. He is connecting with people, just like we're called to. And so in that connecting, he's forming community. He's bringing people into his community. And it looks like this. It's an accepting community. Verses 1 through 5. You see, Jesus reaches out and brings redemption. He brings salvation to Zacchaeus and his house, it says, to people who certainly don't deserve it, but who are willing to repent and receive it. One of the things we have to realize, and one of the troubles that we have when we read through Scripture, is we think that every verse follows at the next second as the verse before. That isn't really true. We have to realize that between certain verses, there can be a span of time. And we have to recognize that in this account, Jesus speaking to Zacchaeus to come down from the tree because he must be a guest at his house, and Zacchaeus taking him to his home, there's time involved. And the next thing we have to realize is that when Zacchaeus stands up, that I will give back, I will do this, that wasn't the first thing he said. 
Jesus had been a guest in his home, and Jesus was most likely sharing the good news with Zacchaeus, as he had been sharing with people for nearly three years at that point. And so Jesus shares the good news, and Zacchaeus responds to the good news. He responds to Christ in repentance and faith. See, the big thing we have to remember, though, is that Christ's community is not about deserving. We don't deserve this. It's a gift. But we do need to respond and receive it. That's important. So what does Christ's form community look like? Well, <laughs> it looks a lot like Edward G. Robinson. <laughs> This actually isn't from Zacchaeus, the movie. It's actually from the Ten Commandments. But for some reason, every time I think of Zacchaeus, and this has been for like 40 years now, every time I hear this story about Zacchaeus, it's Edward G. Robinson. Yeah, Jesus. Yeah, I'm a tax collector. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know why that is. Maybe it's because he's short and he, I don't know. But let's just pretend he's Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus is an excellent example. He's an excellent example of this, you see. Zacchaeus was hated. He collected taxes for the Romans, the occupiers. He collected taxes for them. The Jews hated him because of that. And he was wealthy because he cheated the Jews as he was collecting taxes. Because the Romans said, hey, you get us what we demand, and then whatever you do after that, it's up to you. You want a little on the side? That's totally up to you. We're not going to interfere. And that's what they did. Especially a chief tax collector who had other tax collectors working for him. He was one of the most hated men in the entire culture. The Jews hated the tax collectors. That's why when the Pharisees wanted to denounce Jesus, he said he's a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Tax collectors aren't just sinners. They are the worst sinners. They're scum. They're dogs. They're lower than moray eels or other things that they couldn't eat. Jesus looks up to this despised, hated man who nobody, no one would come to his house because they hated him. He was unclean to them. No one would go to his house. This rejected person, and he says, Zacchaeus, I need to be a guest in your house today. That's called inclusive community, you see. There are no big, thick, black lines between who's in and who's out. It's incorporating people who were rejected and despised, who were on the periphery, who don't deserve to be there. And the problem was that the people outside the door throwing stones and calling Jesus an idiot because he's a friend of tax collectors and sinners, they think they deserve to be eating with Jesus. And that's why they don't. Jesus is always reaching out to the rejects, to the despised, the misfits. Jesus, you see, he didn't, he didn't say to Zacchaeus, I must have been a guest in your house today because he was hungry and needed a place to sleep. He could have eaten and slept at any of a hundred homes in that community. He chose Zacchaeus because he wanted to incorporate him into his community. He came to bring salvation. And he did that by bringing acceptance. See, the crowd's standard was wrong. The crowd's standard was external conformity. It was external righteousness. It had nothing to do with heart righteousness. It had nothing to do with love for God. It had to do with external acts. Zacchaeus demonstrated that his righteousness was heart. And again, if we want to grow closer to one another, we need to grow closer to God. So, it was also rejoicing community. Whenever and wherever Jesus brought the good news, there was always rejoicing by some. And there was always complaining and grumbling by others. Everywhere the gospel is brought, 
there's rejoicing and worship by some and complaining and grumbling from others. Now, that's a really good indicator if you want to get down to nuts and bolts. It's a really good indicator of where your relationship with God is. If you hearing that a person that you despise and rejected has received Christ and you complain and grumble about that, then you need to ask yourself, do I really know the one who rejoices over lost sinners coming to salvation? It's good evidence. It's a rejoicing community. We are called to be a rejoicing community, to rejoice about who God is and what he's doing, what he's up to. When we see people that we said there's no way that person could possibly ever come to salvation, we say hallelujah because God has brought them to salvation. When we are able to form a relationship with someone that's on the, on the edges of our culture, that's despised and rejected, much like Jesus was himself, we say hallelujah God that you love these people as much as you love those who say, look at how righteous we are. That's what we're about. It's a rejoicing community. And worship should characterize all that we are. Rejoicing should characterize our daily relationship. Even when things don't go the way we want them to go. Because it's a community of grace, not condemnation. See, if left to the crowd, Zacchaeus would have been stoned. He would have been, he would have been done away with. And all they had was condemnation for Zacchaeus because they couldn't see the person behind the acts. But having a meal with someone in that culture is critically important. We have to understand that having a meal with someone in that culture meant that they were accepted. It meant that you said, I accept you. You are okay I approve of you as a person. And it's important to understand that it's saying I approve of you as a person. You have value as a person. That doesn't mean we're approving of what they do. Two different things. And we have to know the difference because Jesus certainly did. Eating with someone was a huge statement. It's a statement of I approve of you in that culture. And that, by the way, is why the Pharisees made such a huge deal out of constantly saying that he's the, he's the friend of sinners. He eats with sinners and tax collectors. They were always saying that. Why? Because righteousness, according to their standard, meant you never ate with a sinner. You never ate with a tax collector. You only ate with the people who thought they were righteous. And that's where the problem was. See, Jesus didn't come in the door and tell Zacchaeus, okay, Zacchaeus, here it is. You get it together. You right all your wrongs. You do all the things that I tell you to do, and then I will accept you. It's not at all what he did. He said, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house today. I'm going to be a guest in your home. I'm going to eat with you and have fellowship with you. Then Zacchaeus said, this is what I'm going to do. And that's what we hope will happen with our community, is that we can reach out to people and invite them to have dinner with us, incorporate them into our community so that they can hear the good news, so they can see as they're accepted as a person, that they're not rejected because they've done things wrong in their lives. Anyone who hasn't done something wrong in your life, you're in the wrong place. Anyone who's not a sinner here, you're in the wrong place. That's the message. Not, you have to be here, then we will accept you. If you just be good enough, then we'll love you. That's not it at all. It's the exact opposite. We love you, we accept you, and we want the best for you. And all of that stuff, God's going to work on that with you. Because here's the good news. You see, it's a repenting community. The church is characterized by repentance. We the recipients of the good news, of the gospel, is repent and believe the good news. Turn from what you thought you knew. Turn to God. Turn from the life of serving yourself. Turn to God. Change your mind. Unlearn what you thought you knew about what righteousness was and wasn't. Stop trying to do it yourself and turn to God and let it all be by grace because that's the only way it's ever going to work. Zacchaeus responded to the good news. 
And you see, it's not enough to say, I'm sorry. That's not enough. I'm sorry isn't enough. When we talk about biblical repentance, we're talking about a change of mind that leads to radical change in behavior. See, there are two kinds of sorrow, according to Scripture. There's godly sorrow, which leads to life, and there's worldly sorrow, which leads to death. Worldly sorrow is the kind of sorrow that's characterized in most cases when I say, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I got caught. No, repentance is what's required. We confess our sin and we repent. We turn from it and turn to God. And that's what Zacchaeus was doing. It's a change of heart. And when he says, I'll pay back four or five times, he's following the strictest standard of the law in Exodus 22.1, where it says that whoever steals an ox or a sheep or slaughters or sells it must pay back five head of cattle for the ox and four sheep for the sheep. That's the strictest standard in all of the law. And Zacchaeus is adhering to that. He could have gone to 20% because there are other ways that you can do that. That's the normal standard. He went for the strictest standard four or five times. And by the way, just as an aside, when he says, if I have cheated anyone, he's not saying, I don't know if I have. In Greek, it's called a clash condition. There are four class conditions of if, and the if that he is using in the original language says, if and I have cheated people, I will repay. So he's not saying, I'm not sure if I did. He said, I have, and to those I have, I will repay four or five times. It's a salvific community. Jesus said, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. Does that mean that he did some external act and that made him a son of Abraham? No. What Jesus is saying is that this man has acted in faith. He's responded to the good news in faith. And Jesus affirms that his place before God is as a son of Abraham. And in previous Uh, gospel accounts, we've heard Jesus say, it isn't external acts that make you a son of Abraham. It's not your ethnicity that makes you a son of Abraham. It's faith that makes you a son of Abraham. And Jesus is affirming that Zacchaeus is acting in faith, and he is indeed saved. We pursue God together. We pursue his salvation together. We work it out together. That's what we're called to do, because God is our first love. We connect with him first. And finally, it's a missionary community. That's back to where we started. We're a missionary congregation, not because we've decided that that's what we're going to be. We're that because that's the mission we have been given. You are a missionary congregation because I have sent you to declare the good news, to make disciples. So Jesus Christ, the head of the church, the head of our congregation, is a missionary God. He's a missionary Lord. And all those who follow him, all of his apprentices, are missionaries, individually and corporately. We are sent to reach out to those who are lost, even if they don't know they're lost. And that gets hard. That's like bringing the gospel to the Jews. I don't need the gospel. I know the law. Yeah, but you're lost. No, I'm not. It gets hard. For the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. And any community formed around Christ does the exact same thing. That's who we are. That's what we're called to. That's why we do what we are doing. And it's critically important that we stay faithful to that mission in this world. Will you stay faithful to that mission? Will we give all that we are and all that we have to stay faithful to that mission? Not the one that we'd like to go off on because it's a lot more comfortable, easier, more personally friendly. But that mission. Are we all about that? Let's pray that we are. 
Here's some questions for your application groups. I'll leave those to you, and we'll pray. Lord God, thank you that we have been called, that we have been equipped, that we have been graced by your Spirit to be the missionary people you've called us to be. Help us to connect with you and one another that our fellowship, our communion, our community would be characterized by those things that only you can do. May we be a repenting people. May we be an inclusive people, an accepting people. May we be a people who are characterized by the same love and the same actions of inviting those who are outside, rejected, despised, unacceptable by, the, by some standard into our community. Not just for our sake, not just for their sake, but for your sake, for your glory, for your kingdom. So that in that day, when we see you face to face, we can hear you say, well done, good and faithful servants. Amen.